Hello everyone and welcome to Garrock Farms. Today's video is going to be a bit more educational and we're going to talk about the water on the farm. It's something that people definitely take for granted and uh, we just had a little project done here in the past week and we thought it'd be good to share it with you guys and uh, talk about the water situation on the farm and how crucial it is to our operation and, and some of the history of how we get the water to the buildings on the farm. So Sunday morning, this is almost a week ago now, I come to the milk house and I can hear this chattering and it's in this box that the panel for the, the well because I looked at the diagram and stuff and I'm thinking, oh, this relay went bad. So we have three wells on this farm, but there's two wells here down by the buildings. We got the one for watering the cattle mostly. And then there's the original well that's near the house and that it, it does, it is piped to the barn of course too. So we're able to switch it from one to the other. If one would stop, we still have water. So I knew I wasn't gonna call anybody till Monday morning. That's kind of how we, come to about about doing this video the plumber come and these are well drillers these guys and first thing they check all the electrical connections because you know the, the environment all this stuff is in I mean this this wire is down in the water and they use those um, oh what do they call them them shrink connections so they can heat them with a torch so they seal between uh, that and and uh, see like right here's one I think this is what's in there so then they got this wire that goes up your well. Now this well, I drilled in October of 95, um, just for security purposes, because we did have a little bit of trouble in late 94 with the other well. And it got me concerned because you got all these cattle and even the well driller expressed the, that. He said, there's, there's farms with maybe 500 to 1,000 head of cattle and, and only one well. Then he says what happens is guys like us got to come in at some crazy hours and work through the night, you know, because, and it gets expensive and, you know, you have to correct this. You need water to wash the milk line and the cattle, of course, and everything. So we got the two. So I was basically just able to open some valves and shut some valves and we were good. We had time. So they come to check this out. Uh, they thought wiring. Um, and then right here, because they have this through experience. So this long spool of wire, so like I said, this well is a 57 feet, I believe. And this is taped on the pipe that comes out of the, and this is the pump, okay? You got your motor and you got your actual pump. And that goes right down in the well. And I think that's a six inch casing. I think the one by the house is smaller. It might only be a four inch casing because I mean, that was drilled probably back in the early 1900s. I mean, so they couldn't fit one of these down there. They didn't have all that back then. So anyway, I learned a little something here. So this, I, I believe, went over the top of the wiring like that. And there's these scuff marks in it. This is just a piece of plastic to protect the wiring. And they claim every time the, the pump turns on that it spins a little bit. You know, there's a little friction with the pipe because it's just a plastic pipe that goes all the way down. I think it's steel up higher. But anyway, he said what happens is this is like rattling up against the casing or up against the rock wall. And they thought maybe it wore through to where it hurt the wiring. But then after taking everything apart, they realized it didn't. And then they just figured my motor went bad. And they had, you know, you just replace them. And we could do this. I've done this with my dad uh, on where I grew up. I even helped my first plumber pull these at times. But usually the problem is, is we don't have, we don't have the parts or, you know. And then again, it's, it's not like other things around here where you can just park the one and grab the other one you know you want and I was teasing the guy I said why is it such a nice sunny day it should be like 20 below you know these things don't go wrong on a nice day so anyway they found out yes it was rubbing but it didn't rub the wire through so the the motor was bad so they just shoved a new a new one down in there then they got to flush the system and then being that the wiring's been down there for over 20 years you know and I think the stuff that's got that isn't colored was in the water it's only smart to replace that wire in there, which is pretty inexpensive. It's probably, the labor's probably gonna be the more expensive part of this whole project anyway. So this pump was down there for since 95. Yep. So do the math. And I think when we drilled the well, maybe within a month or so, we had some problems. I think there was a little bit of sand or something. So then they put this boot on and it's this long tube that they can put on. It's got these little, it's almost like a big filter that they can slide down in there. And then of course, I think it got plugged up for us and I don't know, months later or a year later or something, we pulled it up again and we took that off. 
but then the water was good. So then I put a filter in here so it wouldn't interfere with my drinking cups and stuff. Because it, it really that sand doesn't hurt anything if it doesn't get gets caught in a valve or something. It's not it's not like a bacteria or something. So anyway, uh, they took that off and we were pretty good ever since. And I think these two wells, I think the one by the house is maybe 40 feet. This one is 57. And there's, I, I think there's 33 feet of casing, which is this chunk right here. This steel pipe, it's a big, heavy, thick steel pipe. I don't know how thick that is, but it's pretty, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not gonna move that by bumping it with a tractor or something. But so that goes down 33 feet and it's in bedrock. So they go, they probably drilled down here maybe I bet they didn't get four or five feet and they already hit rock. And then from there on down, they're in the stone. So the theory is, is the better water is closer to the surface. And any good well driller looks up here and says, okay, we got sandstone sticking out of the hillside. We got these hills and there's sand in these hills. Your better water is closer to the surface because that's the water that's moving. The lower you get, the slower the water is moving to the point where it ain't moving anymore. And you end up with hard water. You end up with water that's not as good or maybe not as healthy or... I mean, simply uh, what's flowing in the creek down the road here near our, our end of our road here is pretty much the same water that feeds these wells. You know, that's where it goes. Eventually it finds its way out at the lowest point and, and anything deeper than where that point is, is ends up being more stale water. So anyway, the theory is it's not. So they got laws on how far the casing has to go down. And I think it varies from area to area, state to state. There's a lot of rules and regulations on water this here is a seal. Now my state inspector that inspects our, our milk uh, room and, and all our, our equipment and stuff, his job is to, to visually see that this seal is good. So no insects or mice or something foreign wouldn't get down in there. Because what we did, what man did is drill the hole down through the earth, through the rock, so you don't have your natural filter. And when, that, when we do that, we have to be smart about it and put a good seal on so it stays you know, good. And the same thing in there. This little house here by our house is, we used to have a jet pump, which is the pump above ground. And there's a pressure tank in there. And then it feeds the house and of course the barn. And what happened as years went on, I think something went wrong with my jet pump. And then at that time they were able to find a small enough submergible pump, which is the one I just showed you there, that fit down the casing. So now we got submergible in there. So technically we wouldn't need that little house anymore. Our pressure tank could have been in our basement. We just had to dig out. And uh, there, down here, there's what they call a pitless adapter. So we're down, I don't know, six or eight feet. And then it goes across so it don't freeze. It's got O-rings on it. And it's, it's like one part fits into another. So when you set your pipe down in, you can virtually see it with a flashlight. And it locks in. And the weight of the water and the pipe and everything wedges it tight. So it won't leak. And that's what they call a pitless adapter, if I'm not mistaken. So that is your way. So years ago, they used to have a pit. Oh, like a huge manhole, in a sense, that you'd get a ladder. And you'd pull the lid off. Maybe it was wood or something. You'd climb down in there. And that the theory was this, your connection between your well and your buildings was below the frost. But as time went on, those weren't sanitary or they weren't legal for like, for instance, washing up our milk machine stuff. I think for our own personal self, if, if we were okay with it, we probably could still use it. But I, I think they really, they really frown on those. And then up here where the windmill is, there never was a windmill here. My wife and I found that windmill on a different farm that was put up in 93 as but there is a cistern up there and we did videos on that. I think you could probably dig up a clip or something of that. That was all it was on a farm. So what they did, they had an engine down here and the guys before me were telling me this. My dad even was talking. So they, on a nicer day, even in the winter months and there was a pipe that went up and they just, it pushed the water up the hill, filled that cistern, which is, I'm, I'm gonna guess, it's gotta be four or 5,000 gallon cistern. So you didn't have nearly the cattle we got today, but that maybe lasts for months. However, but so they always had to make sure that was reasonably full. And then the, the volume of water put the pressure on to your plumbing that came down to your buildings and stuff. So you had pressure from the amount of water. Yeah, then you didn't need to run a motor all the time. Right, and when electricity going. wasn't here until the 40s, it was a one piston motor, yeah. you know. So that thing was clattering away there on some nicer day filling their cistern. Anyway, and then it's the same thing. A lot of the wells were by the cistern with the windmill running. So the windmill would fill it on nice days and then you could lock your windmill so it didn't have to run for nothing. 
but that was the old system so now we got this so we got two wells here and uh that one i don't know i i don't know when it was drilled i'm gonna guess it, you know as soon as the settlers came here probably soon after that and then of course this one done in 95 and they're all recorded in the state they must have a a system where they know where all these wells are at least uh, all the ones that they found anyway and up there we put that one in and i think oh seven and that one does not have no pressure tank none of that stuff in there basically what you see here and basically there's a pipe that comes out and it goes back down goes under the ground down to my tank where I, where the cattle drink so the cattle don't drink right by the well that's that's um fence so that they can't they can't mess that up and electricity from the <coughs> generator yeah, and you have the wellhead in a spot to where we need to run a tank to the other side of the hill it's pretty much right on top of the hill so you got options of where you want to put where you can put water yeah and it's it's a gravity type of setup and you know it was a little thought put into that and, it, and really where our tank is set up is virtually right in the middle of that whole big area up there so it does give us some you know do you, some, know, do you remember how deep that one is up there that one is i think a hundred and they usually probably wrote it on here at one time but it's, it's weathered off but i think it's like 150. and again because it's higher up on the hill so even just up here above our, our buildings here if we were to drill a well up on top of the hill all we'd be doing is we would still be coming into that same area we'd have another i don't know we could have another 60 to 80 feet between here and the top of the hill of pipe <laughs> now my dad used to talk about like uh in the up on the ridges where we got our ridges here with the limestone and stuff they're pretty high up there some of them wells are like a thousand feet deep or he said it was a wagon load of pipe and it was a nightmare when that thing stopped you know you basically got a bunch of the neighbors came together and of course everything was done by hand and they probably had their their tools because you're you're basically so when you get that opened up and there's this this t out of galvanized you can spin onto this this uh fitting in there that's if you know you're doing it by hand and able to pull up enough with, with a little bit of help now you got to realize that pipe is full of water besides so you're lifting all that weight until you get it up to where there's a splice which but when i remember uh, galvanized pipe would come in 21 foot lengths now plumbing has its whole it has this whole different version of measurement systems you know they're they're common joints so it's either 21 feet or 10 feet or something like that they had but then you'd take all your joints apart and as you got up higher it got lighter and lighter but real scare of the whole thing is not to drop it so they had a you know i know that first plumber i had he had two different clamp systems he used and it's more primitive of course he didn't have all the fancy equipment these guys had it on a truck with a, a hoist and a you know lift and everything it it's just more uh, of course you're not using your back as much it, it's it's more where one person could actually do it even though he had a little help with them so it's really interesting and i think it's something it's it's neat to know how it works just so uh when there is problems you can you can figure out where, which end to be looking so now our pressure tank which we'll we'll maybe show you that before we're done here i don't know how many gallons would it be 30 40 50 gallons of what's in there but there's a bladder in there like a inner tube in a sense so uh, water cannot get compressed but air can so what happens is 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 when your pressure switch which we'll show you that too and that's usually got a start time let's say at 30 pounds and shut off maybe let's say for instance 50 pounds psi so it turns on it fills it up that that bladder in there gets compressed and then so every time you use some water the pump doesn't have to turn on you maybe you maybe have to use i don't know 10 gallons before it would turn on you know so that kind of keeps your system pressurized and and then like here where all our cattle are located this well is above all of them and I'm gonna guess um, the calf barn could be as low as 20 feet lower than this well. So we're so everything is almost gravity is pushing the water. So our pump doesn't really have to work that hard to get this, you know, or in our pressure tank to push the water to our cattle barns um, because it's it's high. It's at the highest point. You know, it's kind of like the cistern thing in a way. But but anytime when your well is down low, and for instance, let's say I want to put a stock tank up on top of the hill up here. You got to realize all the water in that water line whatever that pushes it all the way up there weighs x amount and you only got 50 pounds per square inch this pump is designed for whatever it is it's only going to go so far and it's going to shut off and you may not be able to get your water to that high point general theory on how that works now i'm no plumber 
this is all stuff I just learned from doing it. So anyway, they, they put me a new a new um, submergible pump down. And if you want to know all the details of that, I don't know. There's some, I'm sure some of you guys are going to be asking. And I don't know if we can see some of the wiring or the lettering on here. This red jacket is a, is a common company that they use. And I think, I think what happens is your water must come in through these, this screen and come through and then looks like here like uh so when it stops pumping this this is like a check valve this will it, it won't allow the water to go back down so that pump is fully energized the whole time and then this stuff on my fingers i'm not even sure what they call that there was a um i think it's it's just something that the, it's the mineral in the water and after years and years you're going to get that now you want some mineral in your water when you say you have good water that adds your taste you got really soft water that's good for all your equipment and everything um i know when we came here because it to activate my milk pump when the milk comes in a jar to push the milk into the tank there's a probe down in there and if we just had water in there from the, the well by the house it wouldn't contact is what we call it so really the mineral in the water is what what makes the the contact with electricity you know like you you, you know what you were going to get electrocuted from or if, if you if you were putting the two together it's not the water itself. But anyway, a little bit of mineral. Um, you got lime, you got iron, you got a lot of different things. This water, I know because we sell milk, every so often they got to take a sample. It's just a rule. And they want to make sure that everything's good. And I've heard of farms where they've maybe had cattle problems for a lengthy amount of time. And of course, veterinarians, they get to brainstorm and check the water. There might be something in the water that could be affecting and then they have to dump other things in the water to try to neutralize it. Um, like this well, I think when we first did it, we had some buildup of some of this. And I don't know what they call it. I don't think it's anything uncommon. Um, you'd put like chlorine down there. And maybe you'd do that two or three different times over the course of a summer. And then it, it's not harmful to really anything in, small, in a small amount. Because then you'd run it a while. Or for instance, I'd dump it down there and it'd just switch over to the other well and let it sit down there and do its thing. Kill all the bacteria. So that's the theory seal that up make sure that you don't get anything foreign down in there and once it's good it's usually good for forever until you have a mechanical problem back to the minerals in the water uh moving off the farm uh in this area it's really common to have really hard water in our area and not so much iron but just the the limestone in our area creates a very hard water so a lot of the farms around here that's that's a big issue where they have to put water softeners in and, and things like that to keep their equipment clean or uh, just, you know, even in their house, just to kind of keep uh, their plumbing open and... Uh... Right, you'd see like ring on the sink or the tub or get the spots on the glasses. And again, it's nothing necessarily harmful, but it can get kind of where um, you, you see that deposit bill build up over time, even yeah. your clothes and stuff. So like right in this area we live in, there's a lot of sandstone and sandstone is a very good filter. I mean, as long as it doesn't actually get into the the well itself and uh, usually those things can be cleared up through time I, I know my grandpa my dad talked about this a lot where I grew up it was just up the way here maybe as the crow flies maybe two and a half miles but again same type of environment and there was a well that was kind of out near the fields more and then of course the one we always used and we always asked dad well, why is that why don't we use that well and he said my grandpa had that well drilled before he built the house there was virtually no buildings there they didn't even stay there for the winter at that point yet and he said he was getting sand in there and it's what they call a piston pump, which was something you'd put like in the, it would be in your basement or something. And there was these leathers in there where that piston went back and forth and that, would, that sand would chew them leathers up. And so he was scared that if he built near that, using that well, he was going to have water problems the rest of his days. So then he drilled another well, maybe, I don't know, 400 feet from that one. And it apparently was better at that time. And then later on, when I was a teenager, my dad said, let's see if we can get a, we had, we had one, an old pump from something. We did fix it up and I built the shed for it and everything. And we got water going there. We didn't get sand. So I, but I think the pump we were using today versus, so well, that was the eighties, but even then compared to back in the forties or thirties was uh, maybe could tolerate a few grains of sand. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure uh, the pump technology for wells has come a long way. Another thing too I wanted to ask you guys in the comments, uh, I know when it comes to depth uh, for irrigators or irrigation, that's a whole different ball game. That's a, a deeper well and they're tapping into, I've heard they're tapping into, like in our area, they'd be tapping into the Great Lakes Reservoir. 
<laughs> is what they claim. It's so mind-boggling, really. I think they got to be careful because uh, your neighbors could lose their water yeah. if they didn't. You know, and there, there's definitely some areas in this country that's a lot of controversy. I mean, uh, where the where they're interfering with other things. Yeah, so if you know anything about that or wells in general, leave some comments down below. I'd be interested to know what it's like in your area. Or sand points, that's another thing that's... Uh, I guess was common in this area. I if think you it, had a farm I think it is. along the creek or something, or on a sandier farm, lowland, you could get away with a sand point. I actually know a guy that he runs his, his house and some of his outbuildings all just uh, off a sand point. And for those of you that don't know what a sand point is, that's a really simple well. You're pretty much just the pipe with screens on it. Shallow. That you're just, you're yeah. tapping into the ground. And and I think your pump is above in your house and you're, you're yeah, you're just pulling it up. And there's, it's a cheaper version of a well. And like you said, if you're not high capacity, uh, you know, th I, I believe this is probably a little more of a sure bet you know sand points can be i've heard of guys like shooting like a 22 down that hole which is probably not recommended yeah. but to break up the rust or something that would fill that instead of trying to pull the thing up you know and that would be a man kind of like a quick fix but um i'm sure those things aren't always uh if you're having problems consistently you bet eventually you're gonna have to because plumbing isn't cheap especially today and if you can do these things yourself you can buy these pumps. You don't necessarily have to go through a plumber to do all this if you're knowledgeable enough. And we do all this plumbing around the farm anyway, but I just felt like the last thing we need is, is problems with the well because we were cutting corners or inexperienced with a lot of... And then, of course, the code of uh, everything. I mean, come to the wiring, you got to be concerned about straight voltage. I mean, you don't want to just put anything down there. So the, what what's coming out of here then, it, it's a... It's, it's a plastic PVC pipe, and I, I don't know exact if it's special for the wells or what, Schedule 40 or whatever they do, but that goes up, and this wire is basically taped to it as it goes up the pipe with black tape as they go all the way up. And then, of course, on top it's spliced, but they use these, I don't know what they call them, connections where you heat them with a, with a torch to, to keep the water in the connection from interfering with things you got to get the electricity down and the best i mean like the best system yet is put the pump on the bottom so it, everything is pushing one direction when you have a jet pump on top you're sucking the water which those you got to prime kind of like uh when we pumped our pond we had to prime the pump if they get a small leak or a little air or something there, there there's always been more problems with those see i think longevity was the issue you know and it all depends on the water quality i think that's that's huge now you guys might not be able to see it but i can no, it's a humid day today. And this th this well troll that I think the other one's the same. And I don't know if it's once there's probably different sizes. I think if you're just a, a common house, you'd maybe have a smaller one. But I can see just by the sweat on this tank, you can see the line here where the water is. And then the rest of it must be that balloon that's in there. It, like a two inner tube that expands and contracts. That makes it so that every time you turn your water on, you don't have uh, this pump turning on because you'd be turning on a million times and you're wearing things out faster. So then here's your, your pressure switch. And so that this line here goes to my tank. This valve here is pretty much a, I guess for the plumber to check what's going on here. You know, if you got water here, you got water the rest of the way. There's a water line comes to a gauge, which again, from yours, you can hardly read it, but, and then goes up into what they call a pressure switch. This one, oh, I mean, I'd have to get some glasses to see the numbers, but I, I want to think. Turns on at 30 PSI and shuts off at 50. And you can set it, I think, by these two terminals. And there's directions here that would explain that. Those kind of things you can buy in like a Menards or something. And there's a contact where it disconnects. See, there you've seen it. It just disconnects. It was pumping just for a little bit there. Right where that comes in contact, because of this environment, this is in my milk house. It's damp in here a lot and stuff that will eventually get corroded. So I keep I keep one of these pressure switches on hand so I'm able to switch this out. And it's not a hard thing to do. What will happen sometimes, I'll just come here to a screwdriver, tap on it a little bit, and then it kicks in. Then I know my switch is getting bad. Because what will happen, you'll just come here one morning and it, the cattle won't have water. And then you'll tap on it, it'll turn on. And then again, the next day it'll be the same problem because it just wears out. But I maybe switch that out maybe in... 25 years, I maybe switched it out twice. Okay, this is the one that was for the house. 
I think I had this one put in in 94, but the one that was there was similar to this. And it's got two pipes, so not sure exactly how this works. I'm sure somebody that was in plumbing is going to know this better. But there was two pipes that went down the casing part way down, and then it went to one. And it's something about the weight of the water. So this is basically sucking the water up. Went into, I think maybe here went to your pressure tank and you had your gauge on top, so it was pumping. And then this, this is a plastic nut up here. I think you would open this and you'd have to prime it. You'd have to fill this with water. So the plumber, what he'd do before, if you still had water somewhere or like in the pressure or somewhere he'd get water, he'd make sure he had a pail of water on the side to prime the pump. Otherwise you may have to go down to the creek and get some or to a neighbor's house. Or if you had a stock tank or something, which again, you know, you gotta be careful what you're pouring in there because some of it might end up down in the well. But that, this is what would be above ground or like for instance, would be in your basement of your house. So it would just come over from the, from the casing. Then your pressure switch was here on the side and it's, I, I believe it's the same thing. It sure looks the same or real close anyway. So I guess that would be one I could probably use if I had to. But. That was uh, called a jet pump, I believe. And again, Red Jacket's the brand. And I don't remember why we took this out. We had some trouble somewhere, if we had it down in the well or what, but then they switched it out to a submergible, which is the same as what I was showing you out there on, on, the, on the ground there, is down in both of them now. So all three of them are submergible pumps, and I, I'm i not sure, I can't remember what he told me now, but these, these 50, 60 foot wells are considered to be shallow wells. And I wanna think, 100 to 150 wherever their cutoff is to say it's a deep well i don't know where that is these are pretty close i know where i grew up you could you could take a flashlight and look down the hole and see the water i mean and and like my dad said up on the ridge there that was just he said it was mind-boggling how far they went for water and that's another thing when somebody wants to build a home up on some hill you know you got to take all that in consideration your well is so they, they charge you per foot when they drill a well. And sometimes I'll have a package deal saying drilling the well and then putting all the plumbing down there and then how big your pump has got to be and all these things. I'm sure the deeper they are, the hardier the components got to be. Your pipe going down has got to hold all that water. Think of all that. How many five gallon pails of water in a thousand feet of pipe? I mean, it's a lot and it's heavy. And that's all pulling down on that. So they can't just stick any plastic down there or any, any common stuff. So that's a little bit of the ins and outs of uh, the water here on the farm. Was there anything else you wanted to Probably. Cover? I just don't think of it all at once. But um, it can kind of be fascinating in a way. And you, you could probably Google a lot of this stuff and get some diagrams that kind of show you what's going on. So what we're explaining and what you're seeing kind of all make more sense. Yeah, like I said at the beginning of the video, this is definitely something people take for granted. But it's, uh, it's a very crucial and complex part of life and uh, the farm operation. So we wanted to talk about it. And I learned something. And I hope you guys learned something yeah. too from so this you, video. You guys, when we did all this, you were babies or, or gone to school when I would be working on this stuff or had to do it. When you have all these cattle, even like when it's sub-zero outside, you know, that the water line freezes or the well stops. Now... You're pulling all this out on some bitter day. Again, you know, you're, you're working against this weather and, and all this freezing, so it, it could get pretty wild if you get desperate for water. Yeah. You know, we're now in the summer, I guess on this farm, we got quite a few ponds where the cattle could technically drink if we had to. And then we do have a lot of stock tanks and we try to keep them full just because if something goes wrong, we don't have to go in a panic state yeah <laughs> you know there's a little little bit of reservoir waiting the water is very crucial to the farm so we're gonna end off the video here thank you all for watching and sticking to the end thanks for dad for leading this video and teaching us all something. it's too hot to do anything else yeah. so we were we were kind of thinking of what we could uh film and, and talk about we like to we like to stick with educational stuff i think it's um then when you're watching you're at least you're learning something yeah that being said if there's anything else you'd like to learn about Girok farms or the the farm in general let us know down in the comments but uh that's gonna be it and we will see you all next time.